wrong scientific ideas and myths, such as Adam and Eve, then there will obviously be contention when trying to understand that theology in light of modern knowledge. Thus opens Truden, Truman Ardent Smith's booklet, Modern Science and Philosophy Destroys Christian Theology, put out in 2013. The rumors of Christianity's demise are greatly exaggerated. I do not consider this booklet to be a serious challenge to Christianity. Truman takes shots at what many, but not all, Christians believe, but does not address the core claims of the Christian faith, which remain untouched by his critique. One great weakness of his argument is his apparent failure to distinguish between science and the opinions of many scientists. Similarly, he does not seem to be aware of the difference between Christianity and the opinions of many Christians, and thus presents a few early excerpts of Steve Gregg's review of Truman's booklet. Our topic today, Does Modern Science Destroy Christianity? Welcome to heaven, where truth is upheld to the highest esteem, and to the council here show. Today we will witness a debate between two men dedicated to the truth with completely opposite conclusions. I'm Rick Livingston. I'm your host and a biblical counselor who's been in private practice for the past 23 years in Hillsboro, Oregon. The guests in a few moments, humanist minister and atheist Truman Smith and radio host and Bible teacher, Steve Gregg. So, first we're going to start out by introducing Truman Smith. And I believe I might have him on the line now. Truman, welcome to the show. Hello, glad to be here. Good to have you on again. Truman's been a uh, somewhat frequent uh, guest on the show, and we have him here for a special occasion. Okay? And then uh, I just want to introduce a little bit about him first. He claims to be a former born-again evangelical Christian and is now a secular humanist and a polyatheist, leaving God in ju- or having left belief in God just three years ago or four. I lost track now. Truman has a bachelor's degree from Oregon Institute of Technology in Electrical Engineering. He has a master's degree from Luther Rice University in Ministry. He works full-time as a computer chip designer. He organizes discussion group meetings on science and religion. Truman moderates and presents at many local religious debates and discussions. And he is a minister of the Humanist Society under the umbrella of the American Humanist Association, whose slogan is, Good Without a God. So it's good to have you on here, Truman. Thank you. And now we're going to bring Steve on. Can I just clarify one thing, though? Yes, you can do that while I'm trying to find this number, because I have a different number here, and I'm hoping I get the right one here. So go ahead. I just, want to clar- I just want to clarify that Trude and Darden Smith is my pen name, and that's why I publish under, and I do debates under, uh, just in case anybody wants to look up, you know, where is this guy on the, you know, the humanist minister listing. Okay. Now, I have a number here that I just brought on the air. Is this the number, is this Steve Gregg on this line? Rick, uh, can you hear me? This is Steve. Yes. Oh, good. Right. Okay. I had a different number listed, so hey, as long as it's you, I'm happy. All right. Okay. Welcome to the show, Steve. And I want to introduce him now. Uh, first of all, I've known Steve Gregg personally for over 20 years. He's been on my show before. Steve has no degrees, but he has studied the Bible a bit. Steve directed and taught at the Great Commission School in McMinnville, Oregon, 
for 19 years, often expository, that is, verse-by-verse -verse teaching. Steve has written a full revelation book, which should clear up or perhaps add to your confusion. <laughs> and he's coming out with another book. We'll talk about that at the end of the show. Steve has had a call-in radio show himself for many years where he debates people and also uh, takes on any Bible question from his callers. He has spoken and taught worldwide, often with YWAM, which is Youth with a Mission, a very large, prominent missionary organization. And Steve has five children and is married to Dana Peterson Mason Gregg. So I want to just test your voices. Uh, did I get everything right with you, Truman? Yeah. yeah did you say Truman? Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Okay, you're coming in loud and clear. And what about with you, Steve? Did I get uh, the facts reasonably okay? Yeah, reasonably. Okay. Um, good. And I can hear you okay. And is my sound going very well, too? Yeah. Okay, great. All right. Ground rules. Before we get started, I'm going to give you some ground rules. Um, it's important to stay within the time frames. I want to make sure this is a fair uh, debate and that uh, both sides are given equal treatment as much as possible. Truman has two points, and both have agreed that Truman will present his two points, and they will each be stated in five minutes. Then Steve will have an opportunity to to give rebuttal to that in five minutes. Then they'll have one three-minute exchange each, then several one-minute exchanges back and forth where they can make a comment and maybe pose a question to the other person. Um, I will give you notice about 15 seconds before your time is up, that time's almost up, and that's when you should wrap up, like finish your sentence, and then we'll go on to the next person. I have a stopwatch here on my watch, and I'll do the best I can to keep it as uh, close as possible. That's uh, technical stuff that I have to work with. There will be one call-in question to one guest toward the end of the first point and another call-in question to the other guest toward the end of the second point. At the end of both points and argumentation, each guest will have three minutes to make a summation. So, let's begin, and the way we'll begin is I'm going to read the first point. There's two points that Truman makes concerning does modern science destroy Christianity? That is the question of the debate. So the first point of Truman's, because evolution is true, specifically that humans evolved from other animals, then we can be sure there was no such thing as a first human. Now, you made a sub-point, and I think it's important to read this, uh, that comes from that. Therefore, the Adam and Eve story is demonstrated to be Christian mythology. No first humans, no first sin, no first Adam, so no second Adam needed to undo it. Death was in operation at the beginning of life, not from the curse of Adam and Eve. So, Truman, you have five minutes. Go ahead and elaborate. Okay, thank you. And even in my time, I want to start with a side note. First is I'd like to um, encourage the audience to be truth seekers and to devote uh, seeking the truth as the highest ideal over everything, even higher than a devotion to God, because first we have to know if God exists or not to see if he's worthy of devotion. And not to worry about that if you're a Christian, because... Jesus said, you know, seek and you shall find. So if he's true, you will find him out. So place truth even above devotion to God. The second thing is, I want to mention, I saw Steve in an earlier debate with Bill Ramsey about three years ago. And in there, Steve indicated that even better, the best evidence probably for him is his personal relationship with Jesus, even better than scientific evidence or any other kind of evidence. And I want to mention that. Uh, my assertions are so strong that I'm saying there is no good evidence whatsoever for God. And um, this devotion that he's talking about, I had the same thing. And if he says, I never had um, a relationship with Jesus, and I don't know what it feel, uh, if I don't know what it feels like to be led by God, that'd be like me saying the same thing to him. So I just want to say that I know what he's talking about. I was there, been there, and I think it's a delusion now. 
go back to Adam and Eve, um, yeah, how do we know there is no Adam and Eve? Um, because biological evolution happens over time and within a population. That means there was not a human popping out of a non-human animal. And let me repeat that. There was not a human popping out of a non-human animal. Evolution does not teach that. Instead, humanity emerged over time and within a population. There's no such thing as a first biological male or female human, just like there's no first, such thing as a first biological cat or dog or anything. Doesn't mitochondrial Eve and white chromosomal Adam prove there's an Adam and Eve? No, it doesn't. Mitochondrial Eve, for example, is a most recent common ancestor for all females alive today, and nothing it says nothing about men. Y chromosome, chromosomal Adam is the most recent common ancestor for men, says nothing about women. For example, if my, um, if my family was in a fallout shelter and everybody on earth died from a nuclear holocaust except for me and my family, which, is, which I have six sisters, at that point, my six sisters, um, the new mitochondrial Eve would be our mom because that's the most recent common ancestor. And obviously our mom is not the first human. Okay, so uh, some people might say, well, let me, so does Steve believe in um, evolution? Well, he told me I reject Darwinism, meaning universal descent from a common ancestor. And he also said he's inclined to believe that all humans today biologically descended from one pair of humans like Adam and Eve. So right there, his theology is, has been falsified by science because according to science, we know for sure there was no biological Adam and Eve. So when he ever appeals to something like, oh, the reason why there's evil is because of Adam and Eve, or the reason why there's sin is because of Adam and Eve, all that has been proven to be mythology. So that means his entire theology is built on something that science has already disproven. So I want to make that very clear. Uh, what about people like Francis Collins? They fully accept evolution, and they're evangelicals, so maybe it's not a problem to mix uh, uh, science with religion. Well, the way I understand it, Francis Collins is science first, and, you know, how do you work out evolution with um, theology? Well, he just says, well, that's a theologian's job. So basically, he puts it off onto somebody else without uh, putting answers out there. Um, don't Catholics accept evolution? Well, actually, the, the Pope, uh, I put a footnote in my booklet about how the Pope said, no, you're not allowed to think that humanity evolved from a group of humans because they believe that sin was passed down biologically from Adam and Eve. Um, so can a person be a Christian and accept evolution? Well, a lot of people do, but for me it didn't work out. I tried really hard, and there was no way to make it work, and so I decided um, it was better to leave it. So is that and also the uh, science of neurology, which I'll talk about in the second part, about neurology. Um, so let's see what else I have here. Okay, you got 15 seconds. Okay, well, I'll just say a lot of people, a lot of uh, evangelicals are afraid of Darwinism because, or evolution, because it's like a universal acid that destroys so much, and that's why they fear evolution. But we need to face the facts first and then deal with the consequences. Okay, so I'll leave it there. Thanks. Okay. Steve, you now have five minutes. Good, good. Uh, well, first of all, I want to say I agree with Truman that uh, the seeking of truth is the highest priority, and that is uh, my priority in life as well. And for that reason, I have studied the same material he has studied, both theological and scientific, although my expertise is not in science, of course. I'm not sure that his is either. I know he's a... His, his degree is in technology. It's not quite the same thing as life sciences. I've been more interested in life sciences in my study, but I'm not an expert on it. Uh, it'd be very hard to be an expert on anything more than a very small range of scientific uh, uh, thoughts uh, since there's so much information to process. My, my greater knowledge would be, uh, if I have expertise in anything, would be on what Christianity is. And uh, in this, I have to take exception with Truman for a, a number of reasons. Uh, one is that he believes that science has proven evolution. Uh, this is an assertion that cannot be demonstrated. Uh, I know because I've been reading Dawkins, I've been reading the evolutionists that I can get my hands on and reading their evidences, and, and they, don't, they don't prove evolution scientifically. 
they simply prove that it's plausible. And many evolutionists themselves admit this. Uh, Dawkins is not one of them, and Truman's not one of them, but there are many evolutionists that will admit that uh, evolution is, uh, seems logical and plausible from the evidence they have, but it has not been demonstrated by empirical experimentation, so it's not really science, technically speaking, and has not been proven. Uh, so we've got a, a starting point that's different. Uh, as far as his statement, there's no first couple, uh, that is agreed on by many Christians, as a matter of fact. I'm not one of them. I do believe in Adam and Eve, but uh, that's my personal interpretation. And just as scientists have different interpretations of their data, so Christians have different interpretations of the Bible. The point I would make is that whether there's a first couple or not is not the basis of Christianity. And therefore, even if science could prove that there was no first couple, and I don't believe they can, but if they did, it wouldn't damage my belief in Christianity because the first couple is not the basis of my belief. Christianity doesn't rest on anyone's uh, uh, interpretations of Genesis. Uh, Christianity rests on a historic fact, uh, at least an alleged historic fact, and that is that Jesus Christ rose from the dead and thus proved that he was who he claimed to be. Uh, no one has ever disproved that, and therefore the claims of Christianity being true are really untouched by the whole question of evolution. That's why people like Francis Collins, who is a Christian, can believe in evolution also. I don't, but uh, he does. And there are Christians who do, there are Christians who don't. But that's because Christianity doesn't rest on any one theory about human origins. It's true that uh, many Christians feel that a lot of theological points hang on a literal interpretation of Genesis, and I'm inclined to believe that myself, too. But those points are not the heart of Christianity. The heart of Christianity is that we are created by God, that we have rebelled against God, and that he visited us in the person of his son Jesus to redeem us to himself through his death and resurrection. The resurrection of Christ is a historical event, not a scientific one. Science cannot disprove it. If, they, if they'd like to try, I'd like to see it done. Uh, uh, but if Jesus rose from the dead, then Christianity is true and nothing that Truman has brought up has touched on that that I can see. So I have some differences in the very fundamental question he raises. He says that because evolution is true, well, that's his opinion that it's true. He says specifically humans evolved from other animals. That's his opinion also. It's also the opinion of many scientists, but not all. There are scientists who don't agree with this, and they look at the same data. The data is subject to interpretation, which brings up an important point. We often are impressed with scientists because they study nature. But then when they give their philosophy, we don't realize they've moved into another category. Dawkins, for example, is a great zoologist. He's not a great philosopher. And when he put on his atheist uh, hat when he wrote uh, The God Delusion, he, he put on a philosopher hat. Now, he may be as good a philosopher as he can be, but he's, he's not a philosopher like he's a biologist. Uh, as a zoologist, he's top-notch. As a philosopher, he's just an, another layman, and he's just expressing his own philosophy. A philosopher takes what is uh, the raw data and tells what its meaning and significance is. And Dawkins is not a philosopher. He's a, he's a scientist. I don't think that Truman is a philosopher either. Fifteen seconds. Uh, all right, well, I'll, I'll, yield the, I'll yield the time right there. Okay, so now we've got Truman. You have three minutes. Okay, thank you. Um, first, okay, so one of the points that Steve said was that evolution was not proven, that there's many scientists who don't agree with it. That is not correct. Uh, basically, there are so many, like the scientists say, there's really no biological disagreement over evolution. It's, it's basically the status quo. It's what they call the null hypothesis when it comes to origins. The alternate theory to evolution is that God created things by a miracle, and there's no evidence for that, and you can even say it's been disproven. Um, so, so, there's not, and so there's plenty of evidence, and then, for example, um, some people have made a list of, look at all these scientists who are against evolution. Well, almost all of them have no degree in biology, and, and, and a lot of them aren't even practicing biologists. And uh, the NC, NCSC once did a kind of ingest said, well, we did a uh, Project Steve where we have people who, uh, scientists who do believe in evolution, and their first name is Steve. And that, 
And that list is so huge. Just with the first name of Steve that accept evolution, it just makes us claim crazy that not all scientists accept evolution. There is, you don't have to observe it. There's all kinds of facts that support it, like in the DNA record. There's what they call synteny, there's pseudogenes, G's human chromosome number two. And I wouldn't be surprised if Steve doesn't know about any of this um, because he, this is overwhelming proof. Um, and then he says, oh, well, you know, this has nothing to do with the core of the gospel. Well, here's, I, I preached the gospel for many years. Uh, basically, the, you know, a lot of theologians say you need to start with the fall of man. I mean, look what you're trying to do. You're trying to say Jesus saved us from sin. Where did sin come from? Well, we inherited the sin from Adam and Eve. That's, that's where sin came from. If you, don't, if you don't have Adam and Eve, then you don't have a story about how sin came into the world. So basically, you just want to start with, oh, well, I don't know how we got sin, but, we, but we're sinners somehow, and now we have Jesus to save us. Do you know how sin came into the world or not? Because if you say it's Adam and Eve, you're wrong. It's scientifically disproven. There was no Adam and Eve. So how did sin come into the world? Francis Collins would say, I don't know. Dennis Kinema, another Christian who shows the, ev the evidence for evolution for a Christian, uh, for, a Christ you know, for evangelical Christians, he would say, I don't know. They don't know, because the reason is that there's no answer that's no longer compatible. The whole gospel story is built upon Adam and Eve bringing sin into the world. That's why it's, in the New Testament, Jesus is even called the second Adam. I'm sure Steve is familiar with that Bible verse. So, yeah, I, I think uh, Adam and Eve is central to 15 it. Fifteen seconds. Um, okay, and as far as he says you have to disqualify the resurrection, well, that's what I'm going to do in part two with neurology. Okay, Steve, you have 30 or three minutes for your reply. All right. Well, there's a couple of things I want to respond to. One is that uh, Truman said he preached the gospel for years, and the first thing they told him was to prove the, the fall of man. It's obvious to me from reading uh, Truman's book that his understanding of science and of Christianity is very traditional. I'm not a traditionalist. I'm a truthist, and I'm interested in going to the, uh, to the actual you know, uh, sources of information. Uh, rather than just repeating what someone else tells me. I don't need to decide when sin came into the world. In order for me to know I need to be saved, I need to know when sin came into me. And I know when it was there, when I sinned. I've sinned before, and as a sinner, I'm quite aware that I sin. It doesn't matter when the earliest person sinned. I mean, it may matter, but it doesn't. it's not the core belief. Uh, I, actually, when I preach the gospel, I don't talk about original sin at all. I don't think it's relevant to the gospel. I think the fact that every man is sinner is obvious enough without any doctrine of original sin. Which is not to say I don't believe in that doctrine. I just don't think it's central or that important to uh, the presentation of the gospel. In any case, uh, I believe that uh, Truman is responding to traditional forms of Christianity rather than biblical forms, and that's one problem we'll have. We don't have the same ideas about what Christianity is. As far as the scientists who doubt evolution not having scientific degrees, uh, that's a really a strange claim to make. Uh, Certainly the British Museum of Natural History is a, a place where the, the scientists have degrees. And in 1998, in their, or in 1981, excuse me, in their centennial, they had some displays where they actually said, and this caused a great furor because the evolutionists didn't like them saying this, but they said uh, the idea of evolution by natural selection is a matter of logic, not science. And it follows that the concept of evolution by natural selection is not, strictly speaking, scientific. They said, we can't prove that the idea is true, only that it has not yet been proved false. It may one day be replaced by a better theory, but until then, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is what the scientists at the British Natural Museum said. Uh, if you want to question their credentials, you may do so, but I'm afraid you're not very well read if you think that all the people who question evolution are... Uh, pseudoscientists. Uh, there's many mainstream scientists who've written books about this, and many philosophers of science, like like uh, Thomas Nagel, the atheist, who wrote just this year, Mind and Cosmos. The subtitle is Why the Materialist Neo-Darwinian Conception of Nature is Almost Certainly False. Uh, he's a philosopher of science. There's many philosophers of science and many scientists who say the same thing. So Truman, I think you're being a little, uh, you're just not skeptical enough. I'm, I'm a considerably more skeptical person than you are. Fifteen you seem seconds. to be you seem to just want to believe what people tell you rather than look into it and check it out. Okay, when I get my stopwatch lined up here, sometimes it's stubborn, uh, it's resetting. Oh, it didn't reset. Try again. But anyway, 
Now we're going to go into a series of one minute back and forth. So this is where you can feel what the other person says, and I would recommend if you are inclined to pose a, a question to uh, your opponent. So anyway, Truman, you get to go first. You've got one minute. Okay, uh, Steve, I would say, you know, a 1981 display in the museum, are you serious? That was 32 years ago. Um, don't you think anything happened since then with science? Well, actually, it's been tremendous, tremendous discoveries, such as mapping the human genome and all these other genomes. That started in the year 2000. Before the year 2000, we didn't know any of this stuff, and now we not only have the human genome, we have all these other genomes, and they compare them, and that's called synteny. Do you know what synteny is? I mean, you said, I, I need to look into this stuff and not take people's words. I have looked into it. I know what synteny means. I know what pseudogenes are. I know what fused human chromosome 2 is. I know what this evidence is. Did you know any of it? That's my question for you. So you said, I should look into it. I have looked into this. I wonder if you've looked into it. Are you dismissing things that you don't even know what you're talking about? Well, okay. no, I don't think you, I'm dismissing. Okay. Yeah, I don't think I'm dismissing anything I don't know anything about. I have read on the very subjects you're describing. Uh, what I want to point out is that you don't seem to recognize what is and what is not proved by these things. By showing the similarities and dissimilarities between the genome of a human and an ape, for example, you have only shown that their genomes are similar in certain ways and dissimilar in other ways. Your assumption is that they had a common ancestor and that explains these similarities and dissimilarities. Uh, that's an assumption. That is a philosophy. That is not proven. There are other possibilities, one of which is a supernatural one, and there may be even others that are not supernatural. Scientists are still looking for the best theory possible, and it's true. You're right that the status quo is belief in evolution, but many are seeing it as a shaky foundation, and many people are saying we might be looking for other theories, whether supernatural or not. Go ahead, Truman. Okay, well, again, Steve, I would say, do you know what in biology synteny means? Because you say, oh, you know, there's just similarities. It's uh, much stronger than just similarities. There's also, it also shows descent, uh, because you can see how the bits kind of, the bits in DNA change across genomes of different animals. It's the same way you can tell somebody, if you're a teacher and somebody in your class is cheating, you can tell about, you can tell from looking at that. In fact, even in biblical interpretation, you get different manuscripts, uh, to find out what the correct manuscript is, because there's no correct manuscript, you, you piece these different things together to find out what, you know, as close as you can what the original is. You can see these same descent things in the genome. I don't think you know what synteny is, do you? Do you know what synteny is? I don't know the word synteny. I'll just tell you right there. But I do know the comparisons of the genome are what people are using nowadays basically to say that evolution is confirmed. But many geneticists say it is not confirmed by that. It only confirms what we already would have known from looking at the gross anatomy of these animals. That they're, they, they pretty much follows, it pretty much follows the same taxonomical uh, patterns that uh, they had before they studied the genomes. And that what it means is that some animals are much closer to each other than others in similarity. But to say that it proves descent requires something more than that. We need to actually see some evidence of dissent, or we don't have any proof. We have only one's interpretation of the data. To say that your interpretation of the data is the only possible one is to be naive. There's frankly a lot more people out there writing on this subject than those who agree with you. Fifteen seconds. I'll yield. Truman? Yeah, well, I just, I just have to say, if you knew what synteny was, it's not just a matter of similar, similarities. Synteny also shows descent. You can see the descent. You know, like, for example, if I had uh, footsteps from my house to my car and there's sand in between and you saw the footprints, I could say, look, those footprints are signs that I went from my car to my house. I didn't just magically appear there. Now, somebody else might say, like, oh, well, you know, there's other ways to explain that, but those footsteps are exactly what we see in the genome. And pseudogenes are another example. Of course, I mean, everything is based on observation in science. I mean, science has a lot of deduction. They say they found the Higgs boson lately. How? By deduction. They didn't actually see it. Seconds. You know, sometimes you say, like, well, if this happens, we should see this and this and this. And because of that, we can deduce this happened. This happens all the time in science. All right. Yeah, go, Steve. All right. Well, Truman, I'm afraid I just don't trust your ability to tell what uh, evidence leads to. I've read your book, and I am not impressed with the idea that, that you 
can take evidence and give logical conclusions. Uh, you seem to take certain facts and conclude certain things that they don't prove. And so I'm not really that interested in what you think about this. I'm interested in what can be proven, and you haven't shown that. Of course, you can't, I can't expect you to show that in a minute. We have too little time here to do that. The point I'm making is neither of us are experts in, in uh, genetics, I don't think, but we both read a fair bit about it. We have read different conclusions from different experts, the ones who have more knowledge of it. I don't believe that the seconds. analogy of footprints is a, is a correct analogy there. But, you know, we're talking over everyone's heads, including our own. Uh, the experts disagree about this, and so it hasn't been proven to the satisfaction of everyone. Okay, last one minute, Truman. Truman. Hello? Yeah. Go ahead. Oh, what, what, okay, so yeah, I have one minute what? second. Your last minute segment. Okay. Um, again, I want to state that there is scientific uh, consensus. Uh, it is totally inaccurate and wrong to say that this is something that, I mean, I'm saying virtually all biological scientists, all universities, everybody, there is no contribution, no um, controversy over um, evolution. It's really only between... You know, I'm trying to be respectful, but it's only between ignorant people. It's people who don't know the science. Uh, Ken Ham, for example, is a young earther. Um, and, and Ray Comfort just put out this video about uh, against evolution. But Ken Ham, for example, he admits that he seconds. uses the Bible as a science textbook and interpret, interpret, and interprets all sci all everything through the Bible. Well, that's the problem because the Bible is not a scientific textbook. So anyway, there there is no controversy okay. in the ac academic world. Steve, you got the last one minute before the question from a caller. Okay. Well, I, I think Truman simply doesn't read very widely, and he's only read within the range of people who he agrees with. Uh, in 2001, uh, the Weekly Standard, October 1st, uh, printed a two-page spread called A Scientific Descent from Darwinism, where uh, 100 biologists, chemists, and zoologists, and physicists, and anthropologists, not creationists, Molecular and cell biologists, geologists, and other scientists wrote, we are skeptical of the claims of the ability of random mutation and natural selection to account for the complexity of life. This is not a, 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 an unusual situation. Uh, there's lots of scientists who say that. In fact, Larry Hatfield in Science Digest in 1979 said, scientists who utterly reject seconds. evolution may be one of our fastest growing controversial minorities. Scientists who utterly reject evolution one of our fastest growing controversial minorities, many of the scientists supporting this position have hold impressive credentials in science, unquote. So it's not a slam dunk. Okay, that's time. So now um, I'm hoping that we have John from Seattle on the line. John, are you on the line from Seattle? I'm here. Good. And you have a question for Steve. We're going to give uh, John uh, uh, close to a minute uh, to ask the question and then Steve will answer it. He'll have three minutes, and then Truman will be able to give a rebuttal in three minutes. Go ahead, John. Okay. Um, I'll try to try to contain the time here. Um, so the the questions posed here that I've heard so far are ones of great intellect and of pretty deep consequence, actually. Um, however, as my life has evolved, I see that there is a place of transcendence that makes me look back at my mentalizations on pretty much anything and to see them in a new light, a new context. With my conscious mind, I now look back on my intentions as of a lower form of mental and or psychic energy and draw me into new thinking. For example, uh, I see creation as an evolving thing and happening right now and moment by moment. This means okay, we're going to run out of John. We're going to run out of time. You, you're, you're going to have to present your question to Steve. Okay. All right. This uh, to me that the question of creation and, and evolution really work together. Um, Steve, how do you respond to the idea that there is even more than our mentalizations derived from the limitations of our basic minds above the intellect? or above the heights of our intellect dwells truth, in my opinion. Wow. Uh, I don't even know what the question means. Most of those words I don't, are not in my vocabulary. Do you need uh, me to rephrase it? 
Do we have to I, yeah. put it in English? I can small, understand. Yeah. Small words. Well, small but the question is only a only a short question. So I I just asked how you respond to the idea that there is even more than mental energy involved here. Uh, you're a man that believes deeply in God. I'm I'm picking up. Um, so, what does our mentalization of anything have to do with the actual existence of a, of a creator or of a divine energy that makes all of this creation and evolution happen? That's my question is, is how do you justify Well, I, I, guess, I guess the main problem I have with your question is uh, the word mentalization is not in my vocabulary and, I'm, and it seems to be the key to your question that there's more than mentalization. Uh, does that mean that there's more than what we can understand? Uh, does that mean there's more yeah, to okay. life than what we think? Or what, what does that mean? Yeah, the, what we stir around in our mind and, and call to be truth. Well, I'm not sure how we can know anything that is beyond mentalization in that sense. I mean, yeah, I believe that the best way we can uh, learn truth is to look at reality and use good logic to say, okay, what does this, uh, what's the logical outcome of these things that are observed? I'm a pretty pragmatic person in that respect. I don't have a lot of highfalutin notions, but uh, I, I, all I can say is that some people do believe that uh, God used evolution. Is that, I heard you say something about those things being working together. Uh, it's not an impossibility that God could have used evolution. There are very few uh, evangelicals seem to uh, hold that view still, although there's a growing number. Uh, yes. there, there are theistic evolutions. So, I mean, I, I can acknowledge that there are people who hold that view. And I don't find it to be the view most consistent with uh, evidence. I don't think the fossil record, for example, provides any evidence that evolution of the Darwinian sort occurred. Okay, right. Truman, let's go over to you. Uh, John, keep on the line if uh, Truman needs any clarification from you until the end of his response. So, Truman, you've got three minutes. On the same question? Yeah. Or, uh, or is, the call, anything? Is, the call, is the call still on? Yes. Okay, so I think one way I interpreted your question, too, were you asking um, are there other ways to discern truth other than by thinking or mental processes? Like that maybe feelings a, or your heart or something? That would be a good sub-question. That wasn't my primary, but that would be a good sub-question if you want to address that. Okay, yeah, so basically um, I, I taught a course in critical thinking once out of a textbook, and this is one of the basic fundamental uh, things in critical thinking, and this is something I think that Steve needs to learn himself, is that feelings and intuition cannot uh, discern truth at all, zilch. Uh, feelings can give you some ideas, but you need to test those to see if you're deluded or not. And so this is a, this is a very common a uh, fallacious way of thinking that people think they're getting truth by their feelings or their intuitions. And so basically all we really have is critical thinking to help us discern the truth. And for that, we should learn about uh, logic like uh, they call it abduction, induction, and deduction. Abduction is also called the inference to the best explanation. That's for hypothesis making. So basically, yeah, critical thinking uh, or reason is the best way to determine truth, and, and you cannot depend on feelings or intuition to give you truth. All I can do is give you ideas to test, but it cannot determine truth. Okay, we're going to go into our summation now. So, Steve, you're going to be up first. Give us a three-minute summation on this first point of Truman's. All right, well... Uh, Truman's point was that there was no Adam and Eve, and therefore Christianity is disproven by science. Uh, I don't think he has proven that there's no Adam and Eve. He has asserted this, and there are many in his camp who would assert the same thing. There are scientists who have uh, refuted that, too, I mean, who have at least uh, uh, disagreed. Uh, for example, uh, Ann Gager, a geneticist, uh, wrote an article about the, the so-called uh, no Adam and Eve, the, the myth of Eve. Uh, Francisco Ayala, in 1995, published a, uh, a paper called The Myth of Eve, Molecular Biology and Human Origins in Science uh, Magazine. And he, he used certain calculations uh, from genetics to show that uh, there couldn't have been an original Adam and Eve uh, just a few thousand years ago. 
however, three years later, 1998, Bergstrom et al. published in uh, Human uh, uh, Nature, Nature Genetics and uh, an article called Recent Origin of HLA DRB1 Alleles uh, and Implications for Human Evolution, where he made it very clear that that's not necessarily uh, a decisive uh, research, that uh, they could actually be much more recent that humans emerged. I don't know who's right. I don't even have a dog in the fight. I'm just saying that to say that one thing has been proven when there's still controversy among scientists about it is, uh, is saying too much. I also said, and I will repeat, that Christianity is not built essentially on a literal view of Genesis 1. I don't have any serious problems with a literal view of Genesis 1, but that's my Christianity is, doesn't rest upon that view of Genesis 1. Uh, my Christianity rests upon the fact that Jesus Christ is alive, that he rose from the dead, and that uh, he's, he is knowable, and that I know him. Truman made reference to feelings and intuitions, so I need to learn that those are not a gauge of truth. I'm not sure why he says that. I haven't made any reference to feelings or intuitions, nor do feelings and intuitions have much of anything to do with my belief system. I'm pretty much a critical thinker myself. I do come at the uh, evidence with different prejudices, I'm sure, than uh, Truman has, and we all have to be careful about our prejudices. But uh, as far as intuitions and feelings, I've, they've played no role, as near as I can tell, in my belief system. Thank you, Steve. Truman, you have three minutes to give your summation of your first point. Go ahead. Yeah, I would like to say that it looks like Steve is dismissing evolution, saying such things as like, well, there's not good evidence for it, but yet he doesn't know what the evidence is. Uh, for example, Dennis Bienema has a YouTube series. He's an evangelical Christian, so he's trying to tell other Christians about this, and he goes over the major evidence for evolution. and. You know, it covers things such as pseudogenes and syntony and other, other things, and fused human chromosome number two is another good argument. But, you know, Steve says, well, I don't think there's any good evidence, and he doesn't even know what this evidence is. So he's dismissing it without even knowing what it is. And he's, then he relies on scientific, uh, he's saying there's a scientific controversy over it. I really disagree with that. And he said, he referenced some kind of 2001 article who said there, these people had a problem with uh, random mutation and, and natural selection as mechanisms. Well, there's a lot more mechanisms than that. Sure, maybe there are more mechanisms. For example, gene transfer is another thing that came up. So, the, the, and the and epigenetics is another aspect, too, that's kind of recent. So there's a lot of things at play here. Uh, but that doesn't mean they don't believe in, in common descent. Even Michael Behe is an intelligent design so-called father, and he believes that humans evolved from other animals. Um, so there really is no controversy, like he's trying to say there is. And then he said, also, my, my theology was traditional, and his is Bible. Well, hello, don't you think the traditional theology is Bible-based? I went to a Baptist seminary, and this is what they taught us. So are you saying the Baptist seminary is not Bible-based? Um, I think it's, I don't know, maybe Steve needs to have some seminary education to, to, to get, I don't know, get more exposure or something. And then as far as why they bring up feelings and intuition, I, I did that because at the intro I said that Steve said, that that's even stronger evidence for him for believing, even more than science, because he knows that God is real because of his personal relationship. And I'm saying that is the worst possible way to draw a conclusion. I mean, there are people who think that trees have spirits, and they have a relationship with trees. They have a spiritual relationship with trees. They have a personal relationship with trees. And, of course, Steve would say that's nonsense. You can't have a personal relationship with a tree. It's, it's, it's not, it doesn't have a soul. It doesn't have a spirit. So these are just delusions, and that's why we have science to find out what's a delusion and what's not. Okay, thank you, Truman. We are going to now take a breath here. I'm resetting the watch, and we are going to take on Truman's second point. I will make a note that anything that comes up here on either one of the first point or the second point, feel free to listen to this again and um, Go ahead and look up anything um, that uh, you have any questions about. So Truman's second point is there is no material soul. There is the mind which emerges from the brain. When you die, your mind goes as your brain goes. Okay, Truman, you have five minutes to develop your point. Okay, um, we'll see how far we go with that. Uh, so before this, I wanted to find out, you know, I'm saying there is no soul. There's no such thing. So I asked Steve in an email, you know, what do you think about the soul? Um, 
do you think the do humans get a soul at conception, or is it emerge at the brain, or what? And he says, I don't have this information. Neither science nor scripture can answer this. Well, of course science can answer it, because it's not a scientific concept. I mean, that's basically mythology to believe in a soul. It's not science. Uh, but then as far as why can't uh, the scripture answer it, I mean, you would think the Bible should make it clear. In fact, the Bible confuses soul and spirit. In some places, they, they, say, they say it's synonymous. You know, you can use other words, and sometimes they say they're different. For example, in Job 7.11, they use it as a synonym, and in Hebrews 4.12, they mention it as different. So, I'm saying there is no material soul. Um, what experiment shows that? Well, this could be, uh, we could say it's a matter of abduction, the inference to the best explanation. This is, you know, what the, Bill Ramsey even brought up in his interview or his debate with uh, Steve. It's a matter of finding out which, which uh, hypothesis makes sense. Why would you posit a soul? Um, well, some things we've learned about neurology with the brain. Some decisions are made before we're even conscious of them. They can see that. Uh, people think they're pushing a button, but the scientists can predict which button a person's going to push before that person even thinks they made a choice because they can see it lighting up in the brain. So uh, what they're saying is that people think that they made a conscious decision when other processing parts of the brain have made that before that. That's just one data point. Um, that's, so I'm basically going to bring us on the different data points. There's also this thing called left-right brain cuts, where they cut the corpus callosum, which is a like a highway of wires between the left and right part of the hemisphere of the brain. They do this to solve like epilepsy problems, so they don't have these lightning storms in their brain that, to throw into a fit. And what they found out is that if you show somebody that has this brain disconnected, their uh, left and right brain is processing differently. So if they see something with their left eye that's processed in the right side of the brain, and they cannot tell you what that is because the right side of the brain uh, controls the speech. But if you ask them to, to, to pick out what it was, they can pick it out with their left hand because their left hand is also controlled by the right hand or by the right brain. So that kind of experiment shows how the brain is tied to your thinking ability rather than thinking maybe you're, you've got some kind of spirit out there or something. Uh, there's a bunch of problems if, you, if a person thinks that the souls are given to people. Um, well, first of all, you know, theology people can't even, theologians can't really even define it. I have two textbooks from uh, theology books, one from Ryrie and Deason, and they both just assume that there is a soul. Millard Erickson writes a theology textbook that's really awesome because he goes into a big, long discussion about all the different angles about what a soul might be, and then he tells his, his uh, aspect of what it is. So how do, you, how do you get a soul? Is it at conception? Well, what about identical twins? See, they, at conception, there's one egg, and a uh, sperm and an egg, and there's one cell, and that divides. There's one person developing, and then at some point it splits into two. So if a soul is given at conception, that means maybe there was two souls, so they could each have a half or one, you know, half of that. Because if there's only one soul, that means each one gets half a soul. I mean, these things don't make sense. Another thing is called the chimera, chimera, where there's actually two fertilized eggs, two separate beings growing in the womb, and at some point they fuse together and make one. So if the soul is at conception, would you say each one had a half a soul? And then they combine to have one? Of course, that doesn't make sense. But if each had one at conception, then they'd have two souls when they're combined. That doesn't make sense. So there's a lot of stuff that doesn't make sense there. And I was at a Christian conference once, and there was a Catholic priest who said, oh, well, we don't even believe that the soul comes in at conception. We just we just object to abortion because we think life is precious, that's all. So it just it just shows, well, okay, well, if the soul's not giving at conception, when is it? Is it kind of arbitrary? Like, oh, at one week or two weeks or three weeks? You know, these are questions that show the whole idea is just foggy and meaningless. Um, if humans have souls, do, do animals have souls? So people say yes or no. I mean, sure, their pet dog maybe has a soul, but if your pet dog does, what about your cat? What about a mouse? What about an ant? What about bacteria? Where do you draw the line at that? 15 um, seconds. Okay. So anyway, with modern uh, neurology, we know the brain operates at different parts and different places at, all at once and puts together a composite image for our, our mental understanding. So there really is no complete me that's overlooking everything. It's just kind of a composite image our brain puts together for us. So I'll have to leave that. Steve, you've got five minutes. 
All right. Well, I mean, what Truman has done is summarize a lot of interesting things that science has shown about the brain. Uh, it has not shown that there is no soul. But, but my concern here is that, again, Truman objects to my saying he was tra taught very traditionally. Uh, yeah, he went to the Baptist seminary. That's pretty traditional, I would say. And he said, don't, they, don't you think they believe in the Bible? I think they, they do. I think they do believe in the Bible, but I think they don't always use the Bible for their conclusions as much as they think. For example, when he said that we have to, uh, when we preach the gospel, we should, they said to start with uh, the fall of man. You'll never find a time when Jesus or the apostles preached the gospel and started with the fall of man or even mentioned it. So it, that's what I mean when I say I'm, I'm going to be guided by the Bible rather than by tradition. Many people who use the Bible read things into it or make, you know, make their own conclusions. And he raised that about the soul and the spirit also. He said some people believe the soul and the spirit are the same. Some think that they're different. Some Bible verses seem to lean one way, some another way. I agree. There are those differences of opinion. And there are people who believe that the soul doesn't exist. There are Christians who believe the soul doesn't exist until birth, or they have other views about it. And the reason is because the Bible doesn't answer those questions. Now, Truman said the Bible should answer those questions. Well, I, do, I believe the Bible should answer any questions we really need to know about. I don't think the, that Christianity is about the soul. I believe Christianity is about living for God and ultimately a resurrection of the dead, which has to do with the body. Some Christians believe, and I am one of them, that there is a non-material soul and that this lives on after death and will return to the body in the resurrection. However, there are other Christians who don't believe that. They believe the soul basically doesn't have any thoughts or anything after death, that when the brain dies, the soul dies, but essentially comes back to life in the resurrection. These are both valid biblical possibilities, since the Bible's essentially unclear on that, and I think the Bible's unclear on it because it's not important. I can't imagine why it would be important. If someone thinks it is, then they have a different idea of what's important to God than, than I guess what I do. In any case, uh, that the brain lights up in certain portions when you're thinking certain ways and so forth and feeling certain emotions, uh, this I, I know. I mean, I've obviously read those things too. Uh, but it doesn't lead to the conclusion that there's no soul. It just means that you now can explain what the brain is doing during the time of thinking. It doesn't indicate whether a non-material soul is present or not. And this is the problem with reductionistic uh, naturalism. They figure that if they figure out how the, how the machine works, that they've eliminated the ghost in the machine. But since you can't measure whether there's a ghost in the machine or not, since there's no tools for measuring such things as ghosts, and I'm using the term, of course, figuratively, but something that's not material, uh, then the question of whether there's a ghost in the machine remains an, an unanswered question, no matter how well you can describe how the machine works. Uh, you can describe all kinds of ways that the, the car works, uh, you know, uh, but as far as the presence of someone to direct the car to a, a, de a destination is a separate question than the mechanical and technological description of the, of the car. Uh, if we want to ask why a tea kettle is whistling in the other room, you could describe the physics of what makes the steam make the whistle do what it does when the water's boiling. But it doesn't, raise the, it doesn't answer the question of who put the kettle on and, and who wanted the tea. This is a separate issue that isn't described scientifically. So, I mean, to describe the functions of the brain does not answer, even address the question, in my opinion, of whether there's an immaterial soul until science has a way of, uh, you know, measuring such non-material things, they can't really pronounce one way or the other on it. Uh, Wilder uh, Penfield was the father of neurosurgery, and in the book uh, The Mystery of the Mind from Princeton University, he wrote, through my own scientific career, I, like other scientists, have struggled to prove that the brain accounts for the mind. To expect the highest brain mechanism or any set of reflexes, however complicated, to carry out what the mind does, and thus to perform all the functions of the mind is quite absurd, he said. Now, he's a scientist, he's not a Christian. Uh, the Darwinist philosopher, Michael Ruse, says, why should a bunch of atoms have thinking ability? Why should I, even as I write now, be able to reflect on what I'm doing? And why should I, you, even as you read now, be able to ponder my points, agreeing or disagreeing? No one, certainly not the Darwinist as such, seems to have any answer for this. You see, there's unanswerable questions that science doesn't answer by simply describing the functions of the brain. It doesn't answer the question of non-material realities that may be working in exactly. harmony with that function. Uh, I'll yield it. Okay. Uh, Truman, you've got three minutes now. Go. Okay, I think Steve um, said, why is this important? 
Um, I think this is something that everybody's thinking about, even Christians too, or maybe even mostly Christians. It's like, what happens to me when I die? Uh, there's a famous passage in the New Testament that Paul says, you know, to be absent with the body is to be with the Lord. So when you die, what happens to you? It sounds like, okay, well, we could say we're, we go to heaven. Well, how do you go to heaven? You know your body is in the ground. You know your body is not in heaven. Okay, well, then what happens is, see, you, you are a body and a spirit, and your body and spirit separate and your body goes in the ground, and your spirit goes to, with God. Oh, okay, so your soul or your spirit goes with God. So that means we have a soul or a spirit. Okay, that gives me a lot of great peace and everything. So now you think, what is a soul? Uh, you know, so normally you think, well, the soul is the real me. It's this part of me that's constant, or I don't know, somehow it's just the real me. But when you study the brain, you find out there is no real me. Well, maybe, what is the real me? Well, it's my uh, personality. Well, not really, because if you say animals don't have souls, animals have personalities. Oh, but yeah, but we can do art and stuff. Well, animals can do art. If you consider dancing and trying to impress a mate or even having fun, animals do that. They invent ways to have fun, too. I can give you some examples. So, you know, humans do everything the other animals do. Uh, just to a greater capability because we have more complex brains. We beat them in the brain area. They beat us in some other areas like bigger teeth, bigger claws, thicker hide, but we beat them in the brain area. Um, so anyway, there, what is this me that goes on with God if I'm a Christian? Well, it turns out there is no me. There's, neurology has shown there is no thing that is you. I mean, like I just showed, your, your brain uh, processes things simultaneously in parallel, and it puts together this image for you as if there's a little man in your, inside your head watching everything, but there's not a little man in your head. That's an old idea called the homunculus. That is disproven. There is not a little man in your head. Um, so that's what I'm trying to say. There is, there is nothing like that to believe in anymore. So we should just deal with it. And if there is no soul, that means there's no resurrection because there's nothing to come back to together. I mean, when you're, your mind, we, we know that the mind emerges from the brain, and when you die, of course, your brain dies. Okay, your brain dies and degrades. I mean, look at a senile person. What's a senile person going to be in heaven? Senile forever? This, this is why it's important to understand what a soul is. Okay, Steve, you've got three minutes. Well, I have to just disagree as to the importance of all those points, uh, that is the importance of our knowing them. It may be interesting to know them. And when you describe a person dying and their spirit going to heaven until the resurrection, uh, yeah, that's a good description of what a lot of Christians believe, including myself, but it's not essential to Christianity. If you could disprove that, you wouldn't have disproved Christianity because Christianity isn't about that. Christianity is about a resurrection of a man from the dead, which is a historical fact witnessed by many witnesses and, and uh, basically not doubted by serious historians. It's doubted by, uh, you know, people of other faith systems, of course, but uh, people who just look at the historical records and uh, assess them the way that they do any other historical event have to say that the resurrection of Jesus is a very well-attested historical event, as, as such things go. Now, as far as the soul... Uh, being in animals, I don't have a dog in that race. I, I don't care if there's souls in animals or not. I don't, I don't know that I think there are, nor do I care. I don't care if there's a soul in me. Again, uh, these things are not the things that the Bible is focused upon, and, and they're so, the Bible's actually so ambiguous on this that there, there's probably three or four different views among Christians. If this was an important central issue of Christianity, it would be something the Bible taught in a way that all Christians would see the same. But see, the Bible doesn't go into detail on things that are mere matters of curiosity. Uh, and, and this is where some theologians are very disappointed. You know, they, they have matters of curiosity, and they want the Bible to answer all their curiosities. Well, God's not obliged to do that. God knows what he wants to communicate, and if the uh, details about the origin of a soul is not in, uh, on, on the curriculum, uh, then it's not too surprising he didn't say much about it. Uh, but the question is, how can it be that studying the brain activity can be said to have proven that there's no non-material soul. How, do you, how would you discern if there was one? What, what uh, techniques would you use? What equipment would you use? 
what, uh, what chemical test would you do to see if there's a soul in there or not? As far as a little man in the head, I've never believed that a little man is in my head. Uh, and I don't think I've ever met a Christian who did. So, I mean, the disproof of little men in the head, I guess, maybe that gives some consolation to an atheist, but it doesn't have any impact on Christianity. Again, the issue of Christianity, and this is what your, this is what your book said, is that Christian theology is demolished or destroyed by modern science and philosophy. You haven't shown that it even touches on uh, the core issue that validates Christianity. You haven't shown that science has done anything to address the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead which is what Christian theology is about. Okay. Now we're going to go into a series of one-minute back-and-forth exchanges. So, Truman, you get to go first. Okay. Um, I, I think, uh, Steve, I, maybe I just thought about this a whole lot more than you. Uh, for example, when Jesus died on the cross, uh, he... You know, what happened after he died on the cross? You know, it, supposedly his body was placed in a grave. And then what happened? I mean, sometimes people think, well, maybe he went down to hell or whatever. But there's some kind of spiritual thing that happened. He, he was alive. He wasn't just gone. I mean, there was some kind of existence ongoing as a, as a soul. Um, now, it was, of course, you know, I know it's all confused, messed up garbage because, you know, he was God and man. So is he special? Does he have something we didn't? Or does he have a soul like we do? Um, but it's like, what was, you know, if there is no soul, then he didn't do any of this stuff. And then also I would say as far as testing the soul, yes, first we have to define it and test it, and theologians can't even define it. So, of course, we can't test it because the whole thing is a murky idea. Okay, Steve, one minute. You know, I'm going to agree with you on this one point. The whole thing is a murky idea. And as I said, it's, it's rather uh, non-germane to the question of whether Christianity is true, since Christianity is not about the soul. Now, it may be that the Christian preaching and teaching you heard at seminary and church said that it was. Some people say Christianity is about the salvation of your soul. Uh, that's not necessarily what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that it's about the resurrection of the dead and living with God in the new earth. So the non-material part of man is, the, is not really the important part of the subject. Uh, and there, like I said, the Bible is unclear, but it is murky. Now, as far as where Jesus went when he died for those three days, the Bible doesn't tell us. And for that reason, I don't think it's necessary for us to know. Once again, I think God tells us things on a need-to-know basis. 15 seconds. He doesn't reveal everything we're curious about. Okay, Truman. Yeah, well, that's another thing that's kind of all screwed up about Christian eschatology, the end times for the world or whatever it's like. What happens when you die? Some Christians think, well, you know, uh, there's a thing called soul sleep where your soul just goes to sleep or something and waits for a resurrection. And there's a New, pass the New Testament passage where, you know, Paul says to be absent from the body is to be at home with the Lord. And so you don't sleep or whatever. You go immediately with God. Well, how can you go immediately with God if there's no judgment yet? Um, so, and, and plus, how could you even go immediately with God that, that assumes your soul would go with God, because obviously your body hasn't been resurrected yet, but how could your soul go there if you don't have a soul? And so again, I'm trying to figure out what is a soul and what does neurology tell us. And, 15 seconds. You know, it's just all mythology. It's, it's, that seems like the most reasonable conclusion. Well, actually, nothing you've said has indicated that that's the most reasonable conclusion, but if it's the most reasonable to you, uh, then I'm glad I didn't take your class on rational thinking because I don't see that any evidence you brought up is uh, leading to that conclusion. But there is an interesting thing about rational thinking. If evolution is true and there's no God and there's no real you, then who's doing the thinking in your head and why would you trust it? You know, Charles Darwin, in a letter to William Graham in 1881, said, With me, the horrid doubt always arises whether the convictions of a man's mind which has been developed from the mind of lower animals, are of any value or at all trustworthy. In other words, he says, if our minds are just naturally produced from the minds of animals, why should we trust our thoughts? Uh, we, why should we trust our thoughts if they're just the result of uh, no person in there? It's just uh, the brain acting on chemical and electrical reactions. Uh, why should I trust what I say or what you say? Okay, Truman. Yeah, it's just funny because I said, you know, some people thought there's a homunculus, so some kind of little guy in there, and he said, there's no little guy in there. I never believed that. And now just now he said, well, who's this little guy in there? I mean, uh, if there, who's doing the thinking if there's no little guy in there? I mean, this, that's my whole point. 
There is no little guy in there. The, the brain is thinking, processing things, some, sometimes conscious, sometimes unconscious, different parts of the brain at the same time in parallel. There is not one master controller overthinking it. There's not one you that is overthinking everything. There's just a composite, and it's kind of like an illusion that you are the one. You're basically, your, your mind puts together this image of the world. I mean, you know, we have like all these different inputs coming on at different times, like the vision and the hearing and thoughts and all this stuff, and it's presented to our mind as, as a unified thing, but there is no one person in there in our head. See? Well... Uh, I didn't say there was a little person in there, and you misquoted me when you said, who's that little person in there? I, I never said such a thing. I said, who's doing the thinking if there's no real you, if you have no real self? Now, that's a very different issue than a little man being in your head. Yourself can be the, the, uh, the conglomerate of all your physical and uh, spiritual uh, and mental abilities, but you have a personality. And the question is, how can you trust it, to be honest with you, if, it's, if all your thoughts are merely the natural results of neurons firing uh, that are not being directed by any rational uh, person. I'm not talking about a little person in the brain. I'm talking about you as a person, you being a person. Uh, where does your personhood come from? This is something that neurologists and uh, you know, brain science people are debating a great deal. If you've read much on it, you know this. Okay, one more minute each. Truman? Jason, how can you trust this... Uh thinking that we have if we just can't, you know, like we're all, like the, all the other animals, well, that's why we use science and critical thinking. It tells us what's real. This, you know, according to evolution, and this all makes, comp this all makes sense, there's a survival of the fittest. Animals fight each other for territory, for dominance. Humans do the same thing with wars. This is why we develop technology to make the best weapons. Whenever somebody has a great invention, they usually try to weaponize it right off the bat. Um, why do we, I mean, everything is weaponized. I mean, that's why we have nuclear technology now, for, you know, because of the nuclear bomb. So we do this as a matter of survival. And now that we it's have advanced focus. brains, we also think about, you know, what's good and all that. And that's different parts of philosophy we can talk about. But it, anyway, yeah. Steve? I think C.S. Lewis put it well when he said, in order to think, we must claim for our own reasoning a validity which is not credible if our own thought is the, merely a function of our brain and our brains are a byproduct of irrational physical processes. Uh, there is, you know, science doesn't tell us what's true. Our perception of science may tell us what's true. Uh, that is, we have to process the information. There is a mind in our head that makes sense or doesn't make sense of things. Uh, how does this happen if the neurons in my brain are not being ordered by any rational being they're just uh, random firing neurons. Uh, why should I trust any thought that they send my way or any belief or any feeling? Uh, so, I mean, I, I don't think you're getting my point, and I don't think that in the time we have, I'm probably going to be able to make you get it, so we may be talking past each other. Okay. Now we are at the point where um, we have another John, this time a John from McMinnville, and I'm going to be bringing him on the line here, and he will be posing a question uh, to Truman. Truman will have three minutes to answer, and then Steve will be able to bring a rebuttal for three minutes. So, John from McMinnville, are you there on the line? I'm here. Can you hear me? can hear you loud and clear. So go ahead and pose your question to Truman. Try to keep it to about 45 minutes, seconds. <laughs> I'll, I'll have to talk fast then. Uh, first of all, your sweeping assertion that there is no "quote unquote" me uh, is, is 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 something that a lot of scientists that specialize within neurology would adamantly reject. I, I can think of a handful of them right now, and they're working in in this particular area. Um, you say first of all that um, you admit on one side that in many respects it doesn't particularly apply to science within the scientific method. Uh, ex uh, observed or experimented on, yet later you just have this sweeping idea that neurology has shown there is no me. Um, it, it seems to be contradictory. You said a, you made a statement I want to ask you about. You yeah, let's bring it to the question, John. Okay. You 
said, you can't have a relationship with a tree because they don't have a soul or a spirit. So he said, seeming to indicate that that's needed for a relationship. Is a soul and a spirit needed for a relationship, as it would, as it would seem that you indicated? Truman, you got three minutes. Yeah, I don't... Sure. I, I, I think that me and Steve would both agree that if somebody says they have a relationship with a tree or a rock or... A uh, blade of grass. Uh, there's something, something strange going on. I can't imagine either one of us would say that's a good thing or reasonable. I mean, no, my I agree. I, I agree. I agree. But the question is: Is a soul? You said you the, you can't have a relationship with them because they don't have a soul or a spirit. Is that to say that in order for a relationship to exist, one needs a soul or a spirit? Well, I think a meaningful relationship, there's interchange. I mean, even if you have a relationship with a pet, it's because you give each other love and affection, and there's some kind of interchange. I mean, go, you can have some interchange with me on this. I get my time on, you know. You got three you minutes. Think? You got another two minutes left. Go yeah, ahead. I mean, call it, go ahead. Call it, go ahead. Well, I mean, listen, we can interchange here. I don't... Well, in, in making that statement, it seems that you would, in saying you can't have a relationship with a, with a tree because it doesn't have a spirit or a soul, you seem to say that that, that seems to indicate that that is something that is necessary in order for a person to have a relationship and interact with someone, that soul and spirit is needed there. That's what seems to be indicated by your statement. Well, yeah. Well, there's a quote from a person who wrote a book called, are you still there? There's a person who wrote a book called Personality, Personality Trees who says that spirit, uh, trees have spirits and all this stuff and uh, basically can have a relationship with the tree. And I would say that's a delusion. What's a delusion? That's when you have a relationship with something that's not real. You're seeing things that aren't there. You're hearing things that aren't there. It's just not something you can interact with in that way. Well, I agree with you. I agree with you. However... We do have relationships with people. My question is not about the trees. My question is, are you saying that you can't have a relationship with them because, what is the reason why? The reason why is because there is no soul or spirit. Okay, is that to say that when we do have a relationship with someone, a loved one, a friend, that there is a soul and spirit there? Is a soul and spirit needed in order for a person to have a relationship with, with, with a being? Because it's well, so, I, it I can't, I can't, well, point. I can't. Well, I can't tell you that a soul or spirit is needed because I think it's all mythology. I don't believe there is a soul or spirit. But so your of course not, I can't. Seem, it doesn't, your state, the statement that you said seems to contradict that. 15 seconds. Yeah, to, yeah, I don't understand why. I, uh, basically, uh, you know, humans, humans have a mind that emerges from the brain. Animals have a mind that emerges from the brain. Any creature that interacts with the world has a mind that emerges from their brain. Trees don't have a brain. Um, you know, if you want to have a give and take relationship with something, you need something that can process information and interact okay. with. Time is up. Okay. So, Steve, now it's time for you to, uh, and we'll keep John on if we need him for referral during the next 15 or 33 minutes. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, well, I understand John's question, I think, maybe better than Truman understood it, because Truman was saying, and, and it was just probably an unfortunate choice of words on his part, that people can't have relationship with trees because trees don't have souls, and John's position was then, okay, can we have relationships with people uh, since you believe they don't have souls? Uh, but this is, I think, I think Truman, when he talked about trees not having souls, was probably using the term more as an accommodation to uh, Christian thinking that Christians don't believe that we can have relationships with trees because they don't have souls, and that might have been how he's thinking. I'll, I'll grant him that. Um, the, the thing I, I think you're being too nice. <laughs> <laughs> I, I try to be nice, but um, I, I think the thing here, though, is that he says that he can love a dog or a cat or, or something like that. You can have a relationship of love. <clears throat> now, if your brain is simply uh, doing things that nature makes it do, the laws of nature make it happen. It's just a physiological thing that's going on inside your head when you feel like you love someone. Then really, when you say you love your child, you're not saying anything very significantly different than saying I, I'm having a gastrointestinal uh, pain because that, too, is a physiological uh, thing that nature causes. It's not really something that comes from anything deeper than just uh, the material functions of your brain. And so you're not really loving. 
or you're just having some sensation that makes you think you love. And so this kind of thinking really removes all meaning from all relationships. Trust, love, uh, joy, these things are meaningless. If you have the joy thing going on in your head, you could be joyful uh, while you're watching people being slaughtered in concentration camps because your, your brain is happened, happens to be doing that thing. But there's something in you that says, no, that's bad. I'm, that makes me sad. Your brain also uh, registers that sadness. But there's something other than just the chemicals in your brain that make thought and conviction and values and relationships meaningful. It's not just two machines getting along together in a certain way. Uh, I know that Truman thinks that my relationship with Jesus is a matter of emotion and a matter of intuition, and I've tried to make clear that mine isn't, but his apparently was, and therefore it's not surprising that he mistook a, a delusion for a relationship. Uh, and it's not, that's why I don't think he really had the experience that, that true Christians have, although he maybe jumped through the hoops, he may have bought into a, a religious system, but if he didn't know Jesus, and I'm not talking about emotion or intuition. I'm talking about knowing him like you know somebody that you might hold a correspondence with uh, or that you might converse with or that might have interaction in your life and do things in your life, like provide for you and respond to requests and things. Uh, if you don't have that kind of relationship, I can see why it, it would end. Emotions and intuitions change all the time, and if that's what your relationship with Jesus is based on, uh, it's not surprising it disappeared. Okay, Truman, your summation of your second point regarding the soul. Go for it. Three minutes. Okay, I, I want to start with saying I did uh, felt the same way that Steve did. I thought I had a personal relationship with Jesus, just as he does. Now, if he says I didn't, it was just works or something else like that. I mean, I could say the same with him. He thinks he has a personal relationship with Jesus, but he doesn't. He's not a real Christian. He doesn't have a real relationship. He doesn't know what a real relationship is. For me to say that, you know, that, that's what he's saying about me, and it's just as much nonsense if I were to say it to him. Um, so he went on about how, uh, you know, if we're just a brain and we're captive to nature. Well, not at all. It's, it's kind of like a learning computers. There are computers that can learn from the environment. Um, they, they're, they're like self-programming. Um, so, I mean, we interact with the, with the environment. There's nothing to say that, oh, we're subject to the environment. That's, that's just a, an idea that he has. It'd be a straw man opinion of what I would think. Um, and again, he says there's something in you that's like, that's a subconscious prosper that has this, you know, what's right and what's wrong. This person inside of us knows what's right and wrong and all that. Well, that's just subconscious processing. Um, it has to do with what you think. I mean... As I was a Christian, I used to have some different ideas about what's right and wrong than I do now. Now I have, I do a lot of logical thinking about what's right and wrong. There's a lot of um, moral philosophies out there, and personally, I think philosophy, uh, I think morality should be filtered through consequentialism, reciprocity, and individual free rights. Why? Well, largely because of consequentialism that it results in a better society. Okay, so I have a reason for why I think things are good and bad versus somebody who just says, well, I don't really know, I just feel it, or God said it. I cannot give you a reason why. I mean, so this thing that he thinks there's something telling him what's right and wrong, that's just subconscious processing based on what his background knowledge is, you know? Um, if he saw a lion, he might be freaked out about it. Oh, but you know what? Maybe that's not something to be freaked out about. Maybe it's a tame lion. Okay, but I'm not freaked out. So if he is... His, his intuitions and everything changed based on what he knows, and that will subconsciously tell him. So that's the same thing with morality and everything else. It's all going on your, your background information. Um, do I have more time? You have about 15, or a half, a half minute. Okay, so in summary, what I want to say is what we learned from uh, neurology is that the brain works in parallel and there's this parallel processing, and there is not, like, somebody inside of you that's doing the thinking. Like, there's no me. That's a, that's a unified thing. And so that's what people think the soul is. Well, I'm the soul, and I made up my mind to do this. But there is no me doing all this stuff. There, it's just your brain, the way your brain operates. Okay. Steve, your last three minutes. All right. Well, in this brief interaction with Truman, I've come away with the same impression I had when I read his book, and that is that I'm dealing with a man who's not very skeptical. Uh, 
you know, he'll he'll accept conclusions based on this on data that don't prove it. Uh, he he considers that uh, the uh, the evidence for evolution amounts to proof. Now, by the way, he said that I said there's no good evidence for evolution. I, I, it'd be better if he would quote me because I'm usually careful about my choice of words. I said evolution has not been proven. It's not the same thing as saying there's no good evidence. There's good evidence against it too. Uh, the question is what's been proven and what's not been proven. Truman is assuming from the beginning that evolution has been proven, and based on that, assumes there's no God. Uh, but of course. Why would someone have to conclude there's no God if evolution even was true? Let's 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 allow it for the sake of argument that evolution really happened. Why would this mean that there's no God? You see, he has not reached uh, conclusions for atheism this way. He's what he should have said instead of saying that science and philosophy have uh, destroyed Christian theology. I think he should have said science and uh, philosophy have destroyed some of the ideas that he was taught in a Christian uh, Baptist Bible college. Uh, that's not the same thing as destroying Christian theology. As I said from the beginning, Christian theology is based on one fact of history, which has been uh, looked at from the historical standpoint uh, by experts, and, uh, and I, frankly, we're all welcome to look at the evidence ourselves. It's, it's publicly uh, known. It's published. And, uh, frankly, the evidence is compelling. Jesus rose from the dead, therefore Christianity is true. Now, special views about Adam and Eve, or about evolution, or about the way the brain works, and or even what the when the soul arrives, these are peripheral things. It seems to me uh, that should be discussed after we've decided whether we've got some authority to base it on. If Jesus is who he said he is, then we can trust what he has to say. If he's not, uh, then we're, everything's up for grabs. I believe that his resurrection proves definitively that he is who he said he is, and therefore I can trust what he says on these other things. As far as my relationship with Jesus, it's not based on uh, thinking I hear him. It's not based on feelings. I've told you that. You, you don't seem to understand that because I think yours was, and you think that I've experienced what you've experienced. You have not yet heard why I believe that I have a relationship with Jesus. You're assuming it was like yours. But if you actually knew Jesus, you see, you wouldn't be an atheist today because you couldn't know a person and later deny that he existed. It just is, that's logically impossible unless you're, you know, unless someone's like crazy, you know, to say, I, I know this person, I've known them for years, but they don't exist. Uh, and that's pretty much what you say. If you say, I was an evangelical Christian, I knew Jesus, now I, I say that, and now I say that God doesn't exist. That's, you know, to me, that's not reasonable. Okay. Gentlemen, I thank you so much for your participation. Maybe we might have a future question between the two of you. Of you, uh, did the resurrection really happen? A uh, little food for thought. So to close here, I would like to give you each a chance to uh, give your website out and anything, any just briefly, any activity or a new book that you're coming out with. So uh, go ahead, Truman. Uh, what's your website and anything, any event that you want people to know about? Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, um, my website is trumansmith.com, and from there I think you can find other links. Um, I have a YouTube channel. I do a lot of debates, oh, you know, Christian atheist debates in the Portland, Oregon area, and so I have a whole bunch posted online. Um, and my YouTube name is Shaq Hummer, uh, but if you just look for Truman Smith on uh, YouTube, you'll find it there too. And, um, yeah, I wrote a booklet called Modern Science and Philosophy Destroys Christian Theology. It's a booklet on Amazon.com. So if you put in Truman Ardent, it's easy to, to find because that's a unique name. And thank you. What's that website? One more time because I'll get your book and everything else from that probably. The website, trumansmith.com. All one word, okay. Truman Smith. Very simple. Okay. And, Steve, what about you? Well, uh, my book on the three views of hell is coming out in uh, October, early October. Uh, Thomas Nelson is the publisher. Uh, they also published my first book, which is Revelation, Four Views, a Parallel Commentary. Now, that came out in 1997, but a, a second edition just was came out in paperback just a few months ago. I think it was in May. So uh, we've got a new edition of that book out for, from Thomas Nelson, and we've got the, a book called uh, All You Want to Know About Hell, Three Christian Views, um, that's coming out also in October. Um, you can get information about those at Amazon.com now, even though the second book has not come out yet. It's uh, written up and uh, they're taking pre-orders there. Uh, my website is TheNarrowPath.com, and I do two radio shows a day 
on quite a few radio stations, one's in the morning for a half hour and one's in the afternoon for an hour. Both shows can be heard uh, by those who don't live in the radio listening audience uh, area. Both can be heard uh, from the website, thenarrowpath.com, and we stream it there. Okay, so to find you, thenarrowpath.com, right? That's right. And okay. as you know, Rick, uh, people in the Portland area can hear it on the radio. They don't have to go online. But um, we're, we're on in Seattle and Portland and Las Vegas and Los Angeles and te uh, Dallas, Texas and Central California and uh, I forget where else. Anyway, uh, that's on the radio, but we're everywhere on the Internet. Gentlemen, it was a really a pleasure to have you both on, and thank you so very much. All right, thanks for having us. Yeah, thank you for doing this.